Okay, now everybody can see. So, um, so what is Botox? Botox is a protein that's produced by a bacteria that causes botulism. So the bacteria is called Clostridium botulinum. And we use the toxin that that bacteria produces to make botulinum toxins. So botulinum toxin doesn't, in, doesn't include the bacteria that causes bo, bo, uh, botulism, but we basically have the, the companies that make Botox basically have laboratories full of bacteria and the bacteria is making the toxin and then they harvest the toxin and package it as a drug, basically. So this is a bacteria byproduct. Um, and then the differences are basically sort of how the companies stabilize the proteins so that it can be dried out and packaged into a vial so that we can administer it. So how does Botox work? Well, the reason we use Botox for wrinkles is because it keeps us from making facial expressions that cause wrinkles. And it does that by causing weakness. So if I don't wanna get crow's feet, I have to weaken the muscle here so that when I smile, I don't make wrinkles. That's how it prevents wrinkles. So in the context of using Botox medically, we are trying to create weakness to a small degree. And the way it does that is it blocks the nerve to muscle connection so that the signal from your nerve doesn't get to your muscle. So when we choose a dose of Botox, that's blocking a percentage of the um, nerve ending uh, talking to the muscle. Sorry, that was just a little feedback. Um, so there's a portion of the signal that gets through and a portion of the signal that doesn't. And the goal would be to block an abnormal signal from getting through. And the only thing that gets through is a normal signal for the use of that muscle. And one of the things that I love about Botox is that it doesn't have any side effects other than the weakness. So it doesn't go to your brain and make you sleepy. It doesn't go to your brain and make you feel dizzy or drowsy. Um, it can't make you sick to your stomach or anything like that. Like a lot of the other medicines that we talk about for treating tremor, for treating muscle stiffness, for treating Parkinson's disease, all those things. Um, the medicines have side effects, but Botox, the only side effect is just the side effect of the injection itself, potentially getting weak, but everything else is totally bypassed. So, um, so we love Botox for that reason is because definitely the potential for side effects is much lower. So these are the four types of botulinum toxins that are approved in the United States by the FDA. So there's Botox, which we all recognize, and then Xeomin, which you may see us use quite a bit more. And the reason for that is it's cheaper. Um, same exact thing, just a lot less expensive and a lot of the insurance companies prefer it. It also is advantageous because it comes in a smaller vial. We can get a smaller dose of Botox in the Xeomin um, brand which also ends up being cheaper because then we waste less. So that's another reason why we'd be using Xeomin. Dyspor, which um, primarily is used in spasticity. Um, so for people who've had a stroke or cerebral palsy mostly. And then Myoblock, which is got a different toxin name. It's toxin B, type B. And so we'll use that primarily for folks who have um, excessive saliva because it binds to the um, salivary glands a little bit better but also if folks have developed an immunity to Botox, then we can use Myoblock because it has a different um, type of, um, a different type of protein in it. So um, all of these toxins have different FDA approvals um, and with different diagnoses, basically to have diagnoses associated with their toxin. And that's basically what determines what we order um, and then the cost to you. But they're all pretty much the same. So how do we do Botox? So when you come into the office to get administered Botox, um, it's delivered basically the same way as a flu shot. But it goes into the muscle that's affected by the um, abnormal movement, whatever that is, rather than just one shot into the arm. So we have to put the shot into the muscles that are having the abnormal movement when we wanna do Botox, but it's an intramuscular injection, just like a vaccine. 
state. So it's not a sterile procedure. You don't have to have any anesthesia. There's nothing about it that's um, very invasive and there's no downtime associated with the injections. You just get your injection and then you go on your way. Um, you may experience um, a, the doctor that's doing your injection to want to use a ma machine called EMG. And what that does basically is helps us to hear the muscle activity that's abnormal so that we know we're in the right place. So we use the needle and the needle is recording your muscle activity so that we know that we're at the appropriate muscle that actually needs the medicine. Because I can't see exactly the muscle that I want to inject. So I have to use EMG to make sure I'm in the right spot sometimes. Especially for folks who have tremor or a lot of muscle tightness, there's a very character characteristic muscle signal that comes from that we know for sure we're in the right spot. There's, um, as I said, all done in an outpatient office. There's no need for anesthesia. You can drive yourself. You'll feel fine to go home afterward. There's really no observation period. It's just like getting a vaccine. It's just hard to see. I see. Can I... Um, Sure, that's fine. Because I could have, I guess, got on Zoom and shared my screen would be the other option. Do, I don't have the link, but... Um, that might be better for you guys uh, on Zoom, so you guys can all um, see... So you won't see, like, my body, um, but just... Um, Yeah. Get on through the computer with text. So shield your eyes so you don't see my password. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> You'll just get to see how many emails I have, unfortunately. Just the video. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hopefully this has Zoom. Well, it should work. Yeah. Oh, it's like opening a thousand windows here. That's exciting. <laughs> I read your emails. It won't go to junk. <laughs> Sorry, Erica, what did you want me to talk about? Did you ask me a question? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I take this a minute. Because I don't think I got the Zoom link. So let me see if it's. Oh, you know what it is? It went to, um, oh, this is gonna be annoying because it actually went to a different email because I have two emails, why does it? Um, this is so frustrating, I'm sorry guys. It's, um, here, it's this one. Victoria.holiday at uofhealth.org. Uofhealth.org. I'm not satisfied with my experience outlook. It wouldn't have blocked you. 
I don't think it's just slow. Well, you can, um, I just don't know if it's going to make it in time. We'll distribute the slides. I was hoping this would be easier. I apologize, guys. The contrast is just really hard to see. Um, I don't think it's going to go. Um, okay, we'll check back in just a second, but I don't think that's going to work. So, um, so like I said, you can bring yourself, you can drive yourself home. There's really no nothing concerning about getting the injections immediately afterward because you're not going to feel any different. And we'll talk about why that is. So um, the toxin goes to the nerve ending and kind of gloms onto the nerve ending at the muscle area. So we put the medicine in the muscle and then the medicine migrates to the nerve ending and gloms on to block the signal from coming through. And so right away, you don't feel any different because um, that actually takes a few days to happen. The medicine has to make its way to the nerve endings. Um, so usually folks will get some effect from the toxin in about three to five days, minor effects, and then the maximum effect is 10 to 14 days. Um, and at the end, we'll talk about that again, um, but the medicine is supposed to work for about 10 weeks and then it will wear off at that point and re-inject at 12 weeks. So it's just this constant turnover. But better than taking a pill every day, particularly that causes a lot of effects. So there are advantages in situations where this is really superior. So um, let's check that email again. No, I don't see it. Oh, well. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is what we just talked about. So what are the things that we use Botox for? So we're gonna go kind of head to toes when we talk about what, we're, what I do for Botox and then um, we might have some folks kind of share their experience too. But so the first thing that highest point is blepharospasm, which is um, abnormal involuntary closure of your eyes. And people with Parkinson's disease get this. It also happens out of nowhere, it can just be the only symptom that you have. And that's why we call it idiopathic. So that's what this means is it just happens. We don't know why. And for individuals who have idiopathic blepharospasm, then that means that basically that's their only abnormal movement. It's not associated with Parkinson's disease or essential tremor or anything like that. And then um, an atypical Parkinson's that has blepharospasm very prominently is called progressive supranuclear palsy. And then other forms of dementia, sometimes folks who have Alzheimer's and stuff like that can also get um, blepharospasm as well. And sometimes folks early on in blepharospasm will also complain about a lot of feelings of eye irritation and um, light sensitivity. Both of those things get better when we treat the blepharospasm with Botox. And this is a, just a picture of a lady with blepharospasm. So it's just this really forced eye closure and usually a lot of um, involvement also kind of in the brow area. So when we inject for blepharospasm, um, we focus on the muscles around the eye. So this is called the orbicularis oculi, this muscle right here. And it's basically a circle that when it contracts, the circle just gets smaller. And so that causes your eye to close. So when we want to weaken this muscle to prevent the involuntary eye closure. And so when I do Botox, I usually will inject this pretarsal area on the upper lid, which is right on our lash line. It goes right above our lashes. And that's a good place to inject, even though that sounds scary, because we don't get any droopy eyelids by doing it in that area. Because there's a muscle that opens our eyelid that runs right down the middle. And so if I weaken that muscle by accident, then you get a droopy eyelid. So you got the same problem again. So by injecting here on the lash line, we avoid that muscle, which makes it more likely that you'll have a good outcome. And then along the lower part of the eye, go down a little bit lower so that you don't get any drooping of the lower lid. So this is usually five injections per eye. 
So middle, outside, crow's feet area, and then two on the bottom. So five per eye. And then some individuals like to also get their brow area treated because that can be involved too. And then this would be done every 12 weeks. Nice, good. Another, um, another uh, common uh, cause of dystonia in adults in particular, so this is actually the most common type of dystonia we see in adults is neck. And again, this can be idiopathic. This can be the only thing that you have, the only abnormal movement that you have. Um, but also sometimes people with Parkinson's disease and multiple system atrophy um, will develop cervical dystonia. And um, a lot of folks who have cervical dystonia can have some pain associated with it, especially in individuals like this, where their head is stuck in a single position that can um, cause some pain. Um, and then other folks, particularly who have more of a tremor type of dystonia, um, will feel kind of off balance. Like they don't feel like they can walk a straight line or, you know, be able to maintain a good balance, even though it's really just their head position that's throwing them off. It's not that their balance is actually poor because usually folks, once they get this treated, feel like their balance gets pretty close back to normal. So you can have two types of cervical dystonia, a shaky head cervical dystonia or a fixed turn where I just can't really move my head in the other direction very well. And these are the areas that we inject for cervical dystonia. So lots of different muscles to choose from. And it just depends on the dominant head position. So where the head is turned. And um, again, also like forward and backward movement. Because sometimes folks, especially the multiple system atrophy, tend to get head drooping down quite a bit. Um, that can happen just with regular cervical dystonia as well. But that's the particular head position for folks with that condition. And so if it's really forward, then we tend to focus on the muscles in the front of the neck a little bit more than the back, just to try to release those muscles that are too tight so that the head can return back to a normal position. The main risk associated with cervical dystonia injection is difficulty swallowing. And so that would be if you got too much medicine in this muscle right here, because directly underneath this muscle is muscles for swallowing. So you, there's a particular technique and maximum dose that we use to avoid that. So that's a very, very low risk situation, but that's worst case scenario with this type of injection is if you got some difficulty swallowing. That wouldn't be permanent. As soon as the medicine wore off, it would go away. Um, but um, that's the primary um, adverse effect of this type of injection. Okay, sialuria. Sialuria means excessive salivation. And a lot of folks with Parkinson's disease um, and other neurologic conditions can get excessive salivation. So we can use Botox to treat that because there's not a lot of good medicines to help with that, actually. There's some oral medications that we can use, but unfortunately, those usually come with a lot of problems because if the medicine's drying up your saliva, it's drying up everything else, which means terrible constipation, difficulty peeing, dry eye, stuff like that. So we can be really focused just on the salivary glands when we do the Botox for that. And um, it is a very simple injection just in the parotid gland here. So there's A and B are the two primary injections that we do just right in front of the ear. Um, into the one of the salivary glands called the parotid gland. This is the submandibular gland here, which can also be injected um, if the sialuria is not adequately controlled with parotid injection. We usually try to, um, this is one that we do um, because you use this gland before you inject it just because it's close to muscles of swallowing. But this one is a very low risk, easy injection to do that works for most people but it's very effective, lasts three months before you have to get re-injected. Um, and this is the situation that I was referring to before where we would use that myoblock medicine, the one on the bottom of the list over the other toxins um, to get this treated. And then hand tremor. So um, this is the rare exception where this is sort of a Hail Mary, like we try to do everything else we can 
with medicines and options for surgery and stuff like that before we do Botox for hand tremor. Um, but we do it and there are certain situations like writer's cramp where it actually is the best option compared to medications. So we'll talk a little bit about it, but the reason we don't offer it right off the gate is because it's your hand and I don't want to weaken your hand if I can help it. And that causes some trouble sometimes of getting some weakness um, in the process of trying to figure out how much medicine you need to get your tremor under control. So when we think about injecting for tremor, there's sort of two predominant directions of movement that we think about. So most people who have tremor either tremor like this or they tremor like this, like a twisty kind of movement. And so we try to figure out which one that is and then choose to inject the muscles that either do this or do this and try to avoid anything that's involved in fingers as much as we can because that's where people really get a lot of side effects. So the, the injection that we do for hand tremor are mostly in the forearm. So we try to avoid anything in the hand. Um, and they're mostly kind of on the elbow side of the forearm because the forearm's kind of a mess in terms of how we're designed and everything kind of attaches over here and then goes this way. So this is one of the situations where using EMG or ultrasound is really important to make sure you're in the right soles because you're pretty well guaranteed to get a problem with it if you're not being very careful um, to get into the muscles that are primarily involved. So muscles, like I said, that turn our wrist or flex and extend our wrist are the main inject muscles that we focus on for injection. And then lower limb dystonia is the last one. And um, primarily we'll see this with Parkinson's disease as the adult um, side of things um, and particularly people who were younger when they got Parkinson's disease but it can happen anytime but that's the dominant group of people that will see a lot of foot involvement in Parkinson's disease and then folks who have um, what we call primary generalized dystonias um, where they start in childhood um, usually that starts in the legs and kind of spreads up um, Things that really cue us in to this being a dystonia as compared to just like a regular old leg cramp is that it gets worse with exercise. So the more I do, the more I tighten up. And then when I rest, it goes away. That's fairly consistent with a dystonia, not just a leg cramp. So as in comparison to what we call nocturnal leg cramps, which is, um, when I try to relax at the end of the day or as soon as I get down in bed, my legs and feet kind of tighten up. That's not dystonia. That is a regular old leg cramp, regardless of whether you have a neurologic problem or not. A lot of people get that. This is specific to exercise. Um, so you'll see this mostly when you're trying to walk. It doesn't have to be a lot of activity, um, but this gets worse the more I try to do. And it tends to be pretty painful, especially with toe curling and because um, you're walking on the tops of your toes, which is terribly painful. It makes it hard for your shoes to fit. So muscles that we inject for lower limb dystonia are um, in the calf muscles here. So the gastrocnemius, it's got two pieces to it. We're right um, inside and outside that we'll inject and then soleus, which goes underneath it. And then very frequently we'll need to inject this, particularly for Parkinson's disease, it's called tibialis posterior, and it's really deep in the calf. Um, but what it does is turns your ankle in like that. So a lot of folks with Parkinson's will end up walking kind of on the outside of their foot. Um, and then additionally on the bottom of the foot, we usually will do injections for the toe curling. And there are a couple of muscles up in the lower calf area also for toe curling if that's needed. So I will say the bottom of the foot is kind of a bummer. It hurts. Um, but the rest of these are really not very painful at all. So the biggest things to learn about botulinum toxin is um, it's FDA approved for everything that we talked about today. So your insurance pays for it. That's what that means, basically, is we can ask for your insurance to pay for it and it's covered. So it's not reserved for anybody in particular or anybody that thinks they can 
afford it. This is covered by insurance, unlike cosmetic Botox. Um, so everybody has access to it and should consider it, particularly if they've got a situation where medicine's not quite working out for their particular problem. And um, typically it's administered by a movement disorder neurologist. Depending on the area, um, particularly if you're getting it for other things that we didn't talk about, like for voice, um, that would be administered by an ear, nose, and throat specialist. Um, and uh, we'll talk about kind of the invasiveness of that if, if you want to, um, but that's a different situation. Usually we wouldn't do that in our regular movement disorder office setting. Um, and and we love it because it's better than most oral medications for all of these conditions. Um, and it's got no side effects of the weakness. So it's never going to make you sleepy. It's never going to make you constipated. It's never going to make you dizzy. So it's got lots of at, um, advantages, particularly if you're struggling with some of that already or want to try to eliminate some medications that you feel like isn't a problem that you're currently taking for these issues. Wear is often about 12 weeks, so you need to come to the office four times a year to get this administered um, and um, to can maintain consistent results. So that's all I wanted to talk about because I figured there would be some questions. Um, so any questions or anything anybody would like to share about maybe their experience with Botox? Yeah. Yeah. I'm Yes. That's the worst one. Yeah, by far. <laughs> yeah. bottom of the fit's definitely the worst one. Did you also have to get some injections in your calf yes. or was it just for your toes? Over, over, yep. Yep. See, and the calf muscle injections, much more typical of everything else that we've talked about. Um, the bottom of the foot really is the most painful or palm of the hand. Like if we have to do injections in the palm of the hand, that usually hurts quite a bit too. It's just so sensitive part of the body. Um, and if the pain in the bottom of the foot is just too much to bear or not really worth it, like I said, there are some muscles in the calf area for toe curling as well. Um, it's just generally the easiest way to get to those muscles is through the bottom of the foot. So we get a little bit better guarantee of getting into those muscles if we go that direction. But basically for hand, for fingers and for toes, there's a short version and a long version of all the muscles that control them. And so there's the long version is up in the calf area if the bottom of the foot injection is just too painful. That's pretty well true. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I see. It doesn't last all day long. Mm -hmm. But some days it's worse than others. Yeah. And I keep exercising. Push my way through it. I'm going to do a good job faking it. I'm going to do a good job faking it. I'm going to do a good job faking it. I'm going to do a good job faking it. I'm going to do a good job faking it. I'm going to do a good job faking it. Yeah. So yeah, we were just talking about an experience. Okay, so with the mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Yeah. He said it's, it's, they found it was, it's too painful for the patients. And so they have stopped doing it at the bottom of the foot. Yep. And so and there's large muscles in the calf area as well that can be injected for that. Yep. 
for big toe. Yeah. This is it's frustrating. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I'm sorry that it hasn't been helpful. Um, and I, you know, obviously I don't want to speak to anybody's particular, um, you know, technique or anything like that. Um, just because, you know, that's my colleague as well. Um, but, um, but unfortunately I've, I hate that for you because I feel like that's an unusual experience that it didn't help at all. Um, just because typically we can be very effective in that particular part of the body. This is something that would be worth trying again. Well, I mean, I think especially it's worth talking about the dose. Well, you start on a lower dose. And yeah. I don't recall what that was. Yeah. The second time was a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Well, I actually tried to call that one. And then the third time, I don't recall what the level was. Right. Was, that day I had dyskinesia going on. Oh, I see. And I told my, I said, well, unfortunately, my foot's all over the place now. Yeah. Said, no, this is good. This is good. It'll help me better target. Right. Yeah. The muscle. Yeah. And I thought, oh, okay. You know, and but that was the most painful session. Was and the. Not to scare people, but it was. Well, because you're moving with a needle in your muscle. So, yeah, that's a, that is going to hurt. Um, and is the primary issue toe curling? Like that's the biggest issue. So it's not really like walking up on your toes or ankle turning in it as varies, the biggest issue. Sometimes it's super tight. And sometimes it's so tight that the pain will radiate all the way up my leg. Yeah. And that's a really common complaint as well is just feeling like it's moving up into the thigh area too when it gets very severe. Um, I think it's worth talking about an alternative approach to the bottom of your foot um, and talking about dose for that. Typically, if I can't get toes under control with bottom of the foot injection only, um, I'll incorporate the calf part of the muscles as well. And that's generally pretty effective. Um, just because if there's some redundancy, we have to remember if there's two muscles that do the same thing, and we're only treating one, we may not, that may be the reason why we're not getting the full effect that we're looking for. Does that make sense? Because it's hard for us to know too, especially we see that in the neck because there's a lot of redundancies in the neck on what controls position of the head. Um, and if we're treating the typical way and it's not working, um, then we have to think about what other muscles could be involved and how do we get to them safely. Um, so you've got two major muscles that cause the toes to curl on your foot. Um, and so I think it's worth talking about an alternative approach to those muscles, particularly if that was really painful and not helpful. Right. Well, I was diagnosed with Parkinson in May of 2018. Mm -hmm. And two months later, um, I had Dr. Kapleta. Yeah. Patient. And I talked, talked about my toes. Yeah. And, my, and so I had no idea what was going on. So she had me close my eyes to sit there and relax. And then she got a video camera and said, uh, yeah, your toes are twitching. And I thought, she said, that's called dystonia. And I'm sitting there thinking, what's dystonia? Right, yeah. You know, what right. is that? Yep. And so uh, she said, well, there's different approaches to treatment. And she mentioned about the Botox. Yeah. And she kind of laughed and said, well, not, not the kind for your face. Right, yeah. And then yeah. the other one was medication. And I did not think that a large needle going in the bottom of my foot was very appealing. Yeah. So I opted for the medication, which is Resagibin. Mm -hmm. And I have been on one milligram of that since July of 2018. Right. Yeah. On that. Mm -hmm. So, I yeah. Um, I, for Parkinson's disease related dystonia in particular, there's a chance that Parkinson's medications are helpful. But we know that while the region of the brain for dystonia and Parkinson's disease are close by, they're similar the chemical problem isn't always the same. So it is unfortunate. Sometimes we can't get the dystonia under complete control with Parkinson's medication alone. Um, and so that's why we have the option for Botox. But I agree, my general approach for just put dystonia and Parkinson's disease is to try to treat the Parkinson's disease really well first. Um, so that also I think is a really reasonable thing to discuss because um, it does work well enough for some people. And then for dystonia that's resistant or, or too difficult to control other ways, um, we recommend deep brain stimulation for those individuals um, that need an alternative therapy or would want to do that.
yeah. I have a question. Sure. Um, There's I, a person on Zoom. Yes. I do not have excessive saliva, but I have excessive uh, nasal drip in the back of my throat. And it's very, okay. and it's very sticky. And I'm always uh -huh. clearing my throat and having to spit, which is really un unattractive. <laughs> right. And, yeah. Would, would you be able to do something with that? So, um, from, so the question is about, um, drip, like a nasal drip down the back of the throat, feeling like you constantly got something sitting in the back of your throat with Parkinson's disease. Um, and so, um, per, I, I have not had the experience that the injections for excessive salivation have helped with that. Um, that's actually something that I hear a lot though, is this feeling like there's something kind of just always sitting in the back of your throat, right. um, with Parkinson's disease, um, feeling like there's a lot of drainage. Um, so I generally just recommend folks, um, try to treat it like a nasal drip, like lots of warm liquids, gargling, stuff like that. And then, um, consultation with ENT, if it's very significant, um, sometimes they do have an option um, to figure out basically where it's coming from, whether it's sinus or eyes or something like that, um, where they could administer some therapy. But unfortunately, from my perspective anyway, the way I administer Botox, I don't think that would be helpful. We probably would have to pull in an ear, nose and throat specialist if you wanted a procedural treatment or to explore procedure treatment for that. Yeah, I've I done that. I've had three procedures done by an ENT and that hasn't helped. So I was hoping- Oh, on your sinuses. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say is I, I go through that uh, as well, and uh, and I need more diligent on uh, nasal spray. But uh, the, the weird thing is they they can really figure out uh, after taking allergy shots for years, and also my allergy medicine um, because I still have my clearing of the throat like that all the time, and just drink. Yeah. Uh, Three hundred sixty-five days a year, no matter how much I take. Um, but the one thing that had helped uh, was a prescription nasal spray. It wasn't uh, there was your clothing that you from the case mm -hmm. uh, description. I forgot what description is, but I can I'll text you just to say, hey, uh, you know, I was recommended to this go to your uh, your allergist or uh, ET and see and then that actually does help with the drainage a lot. You know, especially living in this region because people are here have that a lot. Uh, and so yeah I'm yeah glad that you kind of reminded me to start doing that again. Well, and I think there's something specific to Parkinson's disease and just slow swallowing, not swallowing very often, um, that just makes it feel like it's really building up a lot more than your normal. Um, and so I hear that all the time of folks just feeling like there's a thickness sitting in the back of your throat um, that's tough and difficult to deal with. Um, and so, um, so I usually just recommend sort of daily um, oral hygiene kind of stuff, gargling, drinking warm liquid, stuff like that. But if you do have a history of some other issues, it sounds like you've had some procedures, um, that, it, that maybe there are some contributing issues, then nasal spray, stuff like that to kind of dry it up would be helpful as well. Yeah. I'd be yeah unfortunately the Botox. Yeah. Sorry, mm. somebody else on zoom. Go ahead. I, um, I got a couple issues. I got, um, my right eye has been closing lightly okay involuntarily that mm -hmm. has to be done by ent nope i can do so movement disorder specialists would do um basically everything on the outside everything you can see <laughs> so <laughs> we're talking about eye closing um so I'm... um so yeah ent would be more stuff just like in the throat inside the mouth um those sorts of things so yeah movement disorder um Specialists and other neurologists or ophthalmology also depending on kind of where you live um, would be an option, particularly for eye um, area difficulties. Okay. And yep. I've been having trouble with my speech. Can okay. you do anything about that? Not usually. So not um, Botox can't help with speech clarity in terms of just being able to speak more clearly or reduce any kind of slurring. Um, so Botox, unfortunately, that's usually not because of excessive muscle tension or movement. Um, so speech therapy typically is what we recommend for that. And then making sure your medicines are optimized um, is helpful also for speech clarity. Okay, one other question. Yeah. I got okay. toe curling. I got a lot of toe curling. And I uh -huh. got injections. 
every 12 yes. weeks. It's yes. not that effective. Okay. So oh, I, we were I talking about that just earlier. So we were talking about toe curling just earlier. So I think probably you just couldn't hear one side of the discussion. Um, so um, the individual who's here was getting some injections for toe curling in the bottom of the foot, which wasn't working very well. And so that's what we were talking about in terms of just making sure we're treating all the muscles involved um, with the Botox. Um, so depending on the areas that you're getting injected, you might want to explore making sure that the calf area for toe curling is also being treated. Yeah. Getting, so there are getting, some alternative muscles and doses. I was getting the injection in the back and the, and the bottom in of the calf. foot. Yeah. In the bottom of the foot. And, yeah. and I get the highest dose. I get the highest dose you can get. It's oh, okay. Not, it's, not, it's somewhat effective. But yeah. Really well. Is it so for individuals who, who um, unfortunately, muscle relaxers and stuff really don't help. And I'm sure you can probably, some folks can speak to that as well. Um, but um, if for folks who have dystonia that's resistant to other treatments, we do recommend consideration of deep brain stimulation for those that are well enough to do so. So that would be I, the next best option. I, I got that too. Okay. I'm sorry. I, you know, I, can't, I hope everybody understands this is not, you know, something that I can, you know, just voila, here's a solution. I mean, if outside of the office, we um, certainly can't um, make detailed ad advisement. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. So, okay. Who else in the room has questions? Yeah, Max. I'm looking for the word incontinence. Incontinence, okay. Is there any action for bladder incontinence, like to treat bladder incontinence? Um, so, uh, so urology does administer Botox into the bladder for individuals who have some bladder dysfunction. And that actually lasts longer. Usually that only needs to be administered every six months. Typically they'll use that for folks who have overactive bladder or just kind of dysfunctional bladder emptying, like that the muscle isn't working right. Um, so it can be administered um, for the right circumstance. That would again be with a urologist, um, but um, it does have a role. Um, even they use Botox for gastroenterology. Like if you have difficulty swallowing, um, like difficulty down in your esophagus, not in your, the back of your throat, but lower down. Um, they'll also use Botox um, in the esophagus and stomach area. Um, so it does have wide, a wide variety of um, potential beneficial um, uh, management ideas. And that's, like I said, I love it because medicines that you might take for bladder dysfunction have a lot of problems, you know, it makes people lightheaded or makes people feel tired. Um, and so in the appropriate circumstance where bo Botox is appropriate, um, it really does save a lot of problems. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. But I noticed something on there that associated with the head tremors. Yes, ma'am. It can make sure you are steady and the heat. Yep. And mm -hmm. That's what I feel like I'm losing a lot out. So I haven't paid a lot of attention to all this time. Yeah. But that may be cause. It definitely can be. So the question was about head tremor and unsteadiness. Um, and so basically what we think the mechanism is for that is if my head is shaking all the time when I'm trying to move, basically my inner ear is getting a lot of bad information because my inner ear is basically trying to figure out where my head is in space, where my body is in space. And so if my head is never kind of like straightforward looking where I'm going, then it makes it hard for you to feel like you're doing a good job with your balance. It makes you feel off. Um, and so that's a, it's reasonable and worth thinking about, particularly since you're getting Botox already in your arms, um, simply because there's really nothing to lose. Like if we can get it under control um, and you feel better, awesome. If you don't, then that means it's probably just essential tremor that's making your, the disease itself that makes your balance feel off, which is also a possibility. 
um, because we know that folks who have a central tremor for a very long time can also just experience some balance problems. Um, but there's nothing to lose really with just trying to get your head tremor under control and see if you feel better. Um, so it's very reasonable because it'll just wear off. If it doesn't help, it just goes away. And then we're kind of back to square one. Um, but if it helps, then you've got a lot to gain. So yeah, it's a good idea. Yeah. Anybody else on Zoom that has a question? I, I have a question. Sure. Um, so I'm wondering about uh, if Botox is used in the long term, so for a long period of time, is there um, yeah. is there any muting effect on the on the on the nerve? So the question is about long term effects of Botox. If you're constantly getting Botox into a muscle, is there any negative long term effects? Um, and the positive long-term effect as opposed to a negative. Oh, I see. Yeah. Like, do you? Okay. I got yeah, you. So like, so your forehead, like, you mean, you could your problem go away, basically? Like, well, um, or would, it, would it reduce, you know, would it reduce the muscle con um, contractions or spasticity? So I usually only, so she's asking about the long-term positive. So if I keep up with my Botox for a long time, does my problem eventually start to get better or go away. And I will say that I see that in very small muscles that we inject. So for example, eyes, if we're doing blepharospasm injections very consistently over a long period of time, these very small thin muscles actually do start to hold on to the toxin for longer or have less severe abnormal movements over time. Um, so for very small muscles, I feel like that probably that really is the case. Um, unfortunately for bigger muscles, there's so much, again, redundancy, our body makes a lot of effort to make everything work properly. And so, um, the nerve endings are never going to be permanently blocked. So the only thing that we do see sometimes is with very aggressive botulinum toxin injection into muscles, like we would do for somebody who has a stroke or something, for instance, those muscles do thin out and do can become permanently a little bit weaker than they would have been if we weren't administering Botox. So the muscle can kind of atrophy. Um, but unfortunately, because this is brain mediated, brain talking to muscle, the problem remains um, essentially. And truthfully, our brain is a little too good at trying to get signal out to our body and um, we'll sort of reorganize in a way to keep that signal going, even if when we're very long-term injecting. So. Um, just in the tiny muscles of the face, typically, will I see long-term improvement of the abnormal movement. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I got another Did question. You, Hold on just a second. Yes, Erica. Uh, is there a long-term effect from having that in your body? Or does it wear off? It wears off. Um, so that, so Erica is just asking a question about the long-term effects um, potentially on the negative side of things. And so basically it does just wear off. Um, there's a chance with high dose botulinum toxin injections that you could develop an immunity. So you can develop an antibody to the toxin. So it would become um, ineffective. Um, so typically what immunity looks like is I get my injection and it basically does nothing. Um, and so that's different than just waning effects or changes in the, in the dystonia over time. So in the case that we have um, immunity, what we typically will do first is we'll do a test. So basically inject another muscle not involved in the dystonia and see if you get weakness from that. Um, and then we'll switch to myoblock, which is a type B toxin, which um, you have not developed an immunity to. So all the type A toxins have basically the proteins all look very similar to your body, but type B doesn't if you've never received type B. So we would switch to a different type of toxin if you develop immunity. Yeah, sorry, go ahead, Zoom. Um, you mentioned that uh, when you have um, the Sony in your toes and the curve, uh -huh. that yes. exercise doesn't do any good. But Parkinson's, you gotta exercise. Exercise. That's right. So yep. What do you do? So the question is about dystonia in the foot getting worse with exercise and sort of how do you get through that, especially if you're struggling with dystonia, it's not adequately treated and you know you need to exercise. Um, and so, um, so yeah, I think that's kind of the, 
the crux of the of our role in terms of caring for people with Parkinson's disease is using treatments as best we can to facilitate you being able to do the things that we know is important for your long-term wellness. And so, um, so yes, unfortunately, there's going to always be that sort of dichotomy of like the thing that I need to do for my health and well-being and the problems that the disease is placing in front of me. So you could think of it uh, in the same way of saying, instead of foot dystonia, my balance is really bad or, you know, I have a lot of pain in my shoulder and so I can't do the boxing the way that I normally would. There's workarounds, things that we can try to do as best we can, but there is always going to be with Parkinson's disease or with other neurologic conditions, something that's standing in front of us that we just have to figure out how to get around it. And that's my role is to figure out the best way to get around it. Um, but, um, but probably if, you're really struggling with dystonia or another problem with the disease that's affecting your current exercise routine, just working with the person that's, that you're getting the training from or working with, you know, looking at alternative exercises to work around the issue. Cause if the issue is mostly foot and you just really can't handle the exercise, you could focus on upper body. You can get really good cardio out of upper body, um, weightlifting, those sorts of things that can avoid the issue until you can get better therapy. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, good. I have one more. Thank you guys. Oh, sure. One more question on Zoom. Um, Oh, shoot. Would this be helpful with dry eye? A person with dry eye? It would actually be the opposite. So it dries things up. It dries things up. Okay. It does. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Don't need that. (laughs) <laughs> right. And sometimes, you know, I think it's good to formally get diagnosed with dry eye with your eye doctor, because sometimes it actually, so I'm not sure, you know, if you have Parkinson's disease or, or what the issue is, but blepharospasm, which is actually involuntary eye closing, also comes with a feeling of dry eye. So something that we may associate with dry eye, like scratchiness. And so getting formally diagnosed with dry eye would be helpful just to know for sure that that's the problem. Um, but if you've already done that, then yes, unfortunately, Botox would not be helpful, but there can be some things that masquerade as dry eye, particularly in Parkinson's disease that we could try to be helpful with. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you guys. We're going to sign off on zoom questions. Emma, unmute. Can you all hear me? I think so. Yeah. Yes. Okay, awesome. I just wanted to say thank you guys and thank all of you all and thank you for holiday. Um, we do for everybody here. Uh, we have next Friday our DBS luncheon. I know a lot of you all are already signed up. Be back. Um, but just, again, a big thank you to everybody here. Thank you very much. Australia too. What uh what time is it there? Thank you. Yeah. It was great. Thank you. Australia. It's actually this is amazing because it we started this Zoom at 2 a.m. here on Sunday morning, and it has just clicked over. 2.02 a.m. because our daylight saving has just gone back an hour. Oh, wow. So we're starting at 2 a.m. and an hour later it's 2 a.m. and it, yeah, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Wow. Well, you know how grateful we are for you to join us. And so. thank you very much for letting me join in too. Of that was great. Well, we hope you can join our next one. We don't have one in May. We have a big what do we call that? National holiday? We have the Kentucky Derby. Um, ah. So I don't know when we're going to have our main one, but we'll, I'll let everybody um, in that group know for our main one. So Definitely. Absolutely. Bye, guys. Thank you again. Bye. Bye. Of course. You guys, I'm going to start the recording. Nice, good question.